Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, my name is uh, Tor Dagbø. I work as a professor at the University of Agder. And uh, as already said, I've been part of this group uh, that have invited you. And this group is having this project. So, as a kind of point of departure, I want to introduce some of the ideas, some of the questions we have struggled with, and perhaps also some of the ideas that we kind of perhaps a bit too boldly have put to the table. <laughs> so, so if it, it, it might not seem that we are struggling because there might pop up some claims <laughs> uh, here and then, but, but I have put also a question mark behind, so it's kind of to, to see that we are hesitant to make such claims, but that's just to see what have been some of the questions and ideas that we have been working around and, 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 and try to, to, to engage in. So this project that we have, it's called, we have called it Return to Reality. Also, return, turn or return to reality, what does the world ask of us? And, our, and, and, and these projects, uh, there has been some publication, not that many. There are many <laughs> publications that are on the, in progress, so we hope there are more to come. But we are also very happy to have this seminar because we think also arranging conversations like this should be part of our project. Uh, but the concern when we try to put it up now here a bit, a bit uh, in, in bullet points, it's uh, the question of are professional practices in mental health and therapy turning away from or losing contact with the real? And is a return or turn to the real needed? And if so, how can such a return or turn be done. So th those are perhaps a version of what we have been struggling with that we also want to invite you to talk about these two days. And it might be that perhaps there are other questions that seems more uh, important or urgent. So we are really open to, <laughs> to, to also question the questions, so to speak. So let's see what's happened in these two days. Uh, here comes the slide with perhaps some, some claims that uh, might be yeah, too bold or too, too bang bang, but uh, we ask if reality is lost in three different frameworks for practice that we have identified. There are, of course, many ways to identify frameworks in mental health and therapy, but these are three frameworks that we kind of have put up. So the first framework is what we can have called model-centered framework. And the question there is, the is the reality of the subject lost in universal theories and universal procedures? And also, is this a practice that is based on the monologic of professions or professionality, or even perhaps the science underlying the professions? So in this model-centered framework, you have, of, uh, of course, but you have uh, evidence-based practice is one example of such a, a, a practice, but there might be a, a wide range of other practices that's also perhaps not is, 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 uh, is um, they don't name themselves as evidence-based, but they operate from a theory, a general theory of some identified problem which uh, then leads to an uh, uh, accompanying method or procedure to solve the problem, so to speak. Uh, and you might also say that that kind of professionality, uh, you have the, uh, on the part of the professional, there is this uh, imperative of fidelity. You have to be true to the procedures. So you might say, <laughs> a bit bluntly su sa said, that that kind of puts the professionals as a subject at risk. It's, it's operating and, and, and conducting the procedures. And on the part of the patient or client, you have uh, this idea of compliance. So you should do what the professional and the setting tells you to do. So there's the, uh, the client as subject at stake. So there m might be a problem there to kind of enter the 
space of the practice as uh, subjects. Uh, and this is within the monological professions. Then you have the person-centered framework. You might say that as a reaction to this model-centered framework where the client is turned into an object and you can say, no, we must focus on the person. And that's a reaction, it's a, this person-centered. But there might come also problems with the person-centered approach. And you could ask if the reality of the world is lost in such a person-centered framework. And that's because you take point of a departure there in the personal world picture and the accompanying intentions and also actions based on the world picture of the person. And you might ask if at least some versions of person-centeredness or, uh, of, or the idea of uh, uh, user involvement and autonomy and so on, that you kind of ask of what are your ideas about the world, what are you, how do you understand the world, what are your wishes, your desires, your dreams, and so on. You kind of go in there with your intervention that is person-centered, but you kind of just reinforce their, uh, their world picture and their solitary <laughs> worldview, so to speak. So there might be a danger there that the world as something completely else and something that they will this encounter with the world or encounter with reality actually is become uh, even more difficult. So there's even a monologic there, that, that's the monologic of the person that you operate with. And then we come to the, the, the third framework, the social constru constructionist framework. And I would say that I should not speak for all of us in the group, but I think Perhaps that's where we find ourselves in this group. We are within family therapy. My interest has been in dialogical practices, in, in the role of language and so on. So that's kind of where we operate ourselves. But we want to kind of question perhaps the framework we work within ourselves, the social constructionist framework. And we ask if the reality is lost in co-construction of meaning. Uh, and dialogue gone astray. So what did we mean by that? I will try to, I, I put down some keywords here because, yeah, it, it might be, a, a, how do you see, a danger or a temptation that in a social constructionist view, you still operate uh, as if it is the world picture that is of interest. But only now it shifts, it's not the world picture of the professional, it's not the world picture of the soul person, but it's the world picture that we construct together in language all the time. So there's, an, uh, uh, there's a, 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 a focus on dialogue and that we create things together, but perhaps there is a danger that we still operate in a world picture, so to speak, rather than in uh, the world or in reality. So there might be a connection to the world uh, also lost there if we think of for example, dialog dialogical practices, which has been my interest, as a way of altering world pictures and not uh, actually engaging with the world that, that, uh, that is always uh, <laughs> unpredictable and uh, something else than the world picture constructed. Okay? So th that's where we also have asked if, if, if you might say that also dialogue can go astray if it's all about constructing meaning and world pictures together. So even there, the, we have to kind of ask if there is a turn to reality that is needed. So far, so good. I see I had some. Yeah, there, 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 is, a, there is a point there at the first in model-centered framework. And that, perhaps, Rolf, you will come back to that, because the model-centered framework, at least evidence-based practice, they operate within a kind of, with causality. And, but that kind of causality that is there in evidence practice, it's a statistical causality. So what you have introduced in the group, uh, Rolf, is that perhaps we shouldn't leave the idea that, of course, it's all uh, uh, on the side, but that causes are 
actual real causes, unique causes in unique lives. So there might be also a need to kind of address that uniqueness related to causality. And, and in a model-centered framework, also that causality, which would seem like it, it's about reality, how it operates and how, what causes what, but as in, 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 in the sense that it is on a statistical level, it's all also a kind of unreal <laughs> causality that uh, comes with uh, evidence-based uh, uh, practices. Okay. So some more questions put to the put in the room. Are we held captive in an ever increasing web of interpretations in all three and more frameworks? That's one way of putting the question. And I also now had we also had a quote from a, a book of uh, Gumbrecht. His book is called What Meaning Cannot Convey. And he speaks of a hermeneutic maximalist. I don't know who those are, but uh, yeah, maximalist. I think there are, I think perhaps we may be hermeneutic maximalist, uh, every one of us, <laughs> sometimes, when we fall in love with our uh, interpretations of the world and, 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 and lose uh, contact with the world. So, so hermeneutic maximalist hold an interpretation to be humankind's exclusive way of relating to the world. And he problematizes that, and he says that such a stand has led us to a loss of the world. So there might be a world loss, so to speak, in uh, humanism and social sciences uh, when interpretation is the sole interest, so to speak. So you can hear me down there, everything is, yeah. So now comes a quote from Alfonso Lingis, uh, and I put, we put it there under the heading, how can we turn to reality, or how does re reality turn to us? So this is not the answer or, or, or the solution or in any way, but we wanted to bring in uh, this quote from Alfonso Lingis, because it kind of, how do you say, flips something on the other side that is some reality in a way that comes to us, but in his case it's uh, when the other shows up in our world and kind of interrupts us, or even I think the, the essay with I picked this, uh, this quote from, it's called The Intruder. So you might say the other is an intruder in my world, or you might even say that reality intrudes our world picture and questions it or even shatters it in some way. So I think I'll just read it out loud. I have put some words in italics, so that's kind of to say how, 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 how related. It, it, this is not metaphors, it's, it's about our voice, our hands, our eyes, how we, how we uh, so to speak, enter the world with our, our bodies and senses. So when someone turns up and faces us, his or her face says, here I am, and afflicts my sensibility immediately. It is felt in my eyes, whose direction is confounded, whose focus softens. My eyes lose sight of its objectives and turn down in a recoil of respect. It is felt in my voice that is in command of its own order and speaks to command. Yeah, it is felt in my voice that is, co is in command and it speaks its own order and speaks to command, but which falters and hesitates and loses its coherence before the non-response and the silence of the other. The surface of the other as surfaces of susceptibility and suffering troubles my exploring, manipula manipulating, and expressive hand. Yeah, for me it's a wonderful quote, and it, it, it's like if you, 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 you go into the world with your ideas and intentions, and you have something to say, and then someone turns up and it just pff, falls apart in some way. <laughs> and you have to kind of reorganize or regroup or uh, 
find another way or uh, yeah. So that's kind of a, a, a picture of how reality, in this time in, in the appearance of the other, kind of sh shatters the <laughs> what you have established and you have to kind of start anew in some way. And, and link, yeah. I think we'll yeah. I think we'll go on to next here. So, even more questions put to the table. Reality, the world, the other. The, yeah, we can discuss what concepts to use here. It comes to us with a claim. It asks something from us. Practice must be careful not to miss this claim. Yeah, from the other, from the reality. Can the encounter with reality be cons considered to be an ethical event? ethical realism. So that's one of the concepts that, that we have also <laughs> been writing a bit about and, and also discussing, can we talk of a realism, but then say that it's kind of ethical realism, not a theoretical realism. Often we, we, we tend to think that realism is the idea that our theory has a one-to-one -one relation to reality, <coughs> but uh, ethical realism is something quite different. And even I think you, Rolf, you played with the idea to call it real realism <laughs> as opposed to uh, something <laughs> unreal realism. Yeah. So we are inspired by the way Tim Ingle, Sheila McNamee, and Gert Biester uh, seem to struggle. Uh, I don't know if they struggle, but <laughs> struggle with the similar questions in their work. And I have just now to, 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 to conclude. Uh, uh, picked some quotes from you, so you, you will soon hear you and you can correct or whatever, you will hear you with your own voice. But Ingol, in one of the texts he has shared with us, Dreaming of Dragons, he has this interesting uh, discussion about the, 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 the relation or difference between science and religion. But yet, he says, yet questions about which can better represent the world, religion or science, are wrongly posed. The question is not then, which better represent the world? For the real contest lies elsewhere. It turns on whether our ways of knowing and imagining are enshrined with an existential commitment to the world in which we find ourselves, and with due acknowledgement of our death to the world for what it has to teach to us. So for me, for us, it was to spot <laughs> the encounter of the world as per perhaps an ethical encounter. Yeah. And there is something that the world uh, wants from us, so to speak. McNamee, in uh, the chapter you have shared, Radical Presence, an alternative to mindfulness. Ma radical Presence offers us a way out of the self-contained focus offered by individualist tradition or even this person-centeredness that I have uh, referred to. And then I think I interpret you <laughs> right, is that the message of mindfulness is akin to giving sedative drugs to someone who is suffering from poverty and oppression. So in your case, in your chapter, it's about mindfulness, but we could even ask if the whole focus on mental health, we discussed we have in Norway an enormous focus on mental health, but isolating mental health as a kind of phenomena on its own terms might be that kind of a sedative, so to speak. Uh, so when we orient ourselves to the other, to the complexity and difference with curiosity and desire to know differently, we are radically present. And then the last quote is from Gert, uh, not in one of the texts he shared, so I went to his latest book, World Centered Education, Understanding and sense-making. We might say that this is an interpretative relation to the world. Goes from me to the world. There is, therefore, another gesture that runs the opposite direction, from the world to me. The leading question here is not what I might want from the world, but what the world wants from me. That is, what the world is asking from me. So, as you probably see that even the title of our project has stolen this phrase from Gert Bista. I actually wondered, is it from the conversation? So, so, but, but I found it, so it's not ours, it's, it's there in your uh, writing. So that was kind of what I wanted to, 
to say, a way to introduce it. So we can see if the way we have this exposition of what we have been doing, there could be other ways of exposing it, but this is what we did now, and we can see if this gives meaning or if there are other questions to be discussed or whatever. But this is one version of what we are struggling with in a project, and we have invited you, especially, to struggle with us for two heavy days. <laughs> so, yes, thank you. Yeah? Yeah, and I think...